Hey everybody, how's it going? This is Steve Gill. I'm back with you for another installment of Loving the Scriptures. Um, and really excited to, um, uh, to talk about uh, the Bible this time and in the weeks to follow. I'm always excited, don't get me wrong. Um, I've, I've, uh, we've been having a wonderful journey, um, in the, in the book of Acts, um, as well as just some other breaks that we've had here and there, um, along the, along the way, along the journey. And, uh, we've come up on another one of those breaks. This one is probably going to be a little bit longer, uh, of a break than, uh, than the ones in times past. Um, usually it's just, uh, I usually take a break just for a couple of weeks before picking up in Acts. The, this time I'm going I'm going to guess that it's going to we're going to be uh, away from Acts for at least um, at least four episodes. Um, I think I mentioned that uh, before. Um, and so what we're going to be covering is we're going to be covering the gospel. And um, we will get to that in just a second. But before I do that, um, one thing that I want to do, I want to I want to tidy up a little bit uh, of something from Acts um, in chapter eight, um, something that I had intended to mention um, after um, after I, I transitioned you out of the sermon piece that that I that 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 I put in the episode, um, from the sermon that I preached on, um, the, the whole account of Philip and the, and the Ethiopian eunuch. And, um, it just, it just slipped my mind. Uh, I didn't mention it and I'll mention it now. I didn't mention it in the sermon either. Um, you know, and I think I had intended to, but I think because of time and because I was, you know, there was a, there was a tight crunch time, um, with that, um, I think, I, and I don't remember whether this was a conscious decision or if it's something that just unconsciously happened, but I, I overlooked mentioning this in the sermon as well. But it has to do with um, Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Now, if you were to look at your Bible, when I make that reference of Acts chapter 8, verse 37, you would look at the text and then you would realize, hey, wait a minute, there is no verse 37 and it actually goes from verse 36 um, to verse uh, to verse 38. And you might think, well, what's going on? Well, most Bibles, including the one that I'm looking at right now, most Bibles will help you out on this, um, and they'll include a footnote in here. Um, and let me just read this here because this is what some uh, manuscripts have, uh, ancient manuscripts have have had um, in this in this portion of Acts. Um, where let's see in verse 37 and this is what the footnote says verse 37 in some of those manuscripts says well actually let me go back um let me read verse 36 and then read the footnote of verse 37 so you see how it connects together okay so in verse 36 it says and as they were going going along the road they came to some water and the eunuch said see here is water what prevents me from being baptized and then verse 37 which isn't in the actual text here, but in the foot in the footnote says, and Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. And then it goes, then it goes into, into verse 38, which is in the actual textual section there where they, where they pull over and then, and then, uh, the eunuch is, uh, is baptized. So, um, I, I felt I needed to address that just ever so briefly, uh, you know, because some people might struggle with that. Some people might think, well, what's the whole deal here? Is there a conspiracy and, you know, things like that? You know, um, you know, those sorts of things cross people's minds. Some people raise objections to that and they wonder, well, what's really scripture and, and everything like that. But y- you don't need to you don't need to get too disturbed about something like that. For one thing, um, if your Bible is like mine, which I think most Bibles are, at least there is the integrity um, of the translators to say, hey, this is in some manuscripts, but it's likely not part of the original. And it's not even part of uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the more ancient uh, earlier manuscripts. And it's not a part of Aleph, A, B, C or D or anything like that. Um, if you don't know what those are, don't worry about it. But, um, it, you know, it, they, they're what they say is, is that it, in all likelihood, uh, just based on what you have in some of the earlier manuscripts, where it doesn't have that in, that that was that that was inserted at uh, some time down the road. 
Um, and so, and in the in the UBS um, uh, Greek New Testament, um, in the apparatus, it gives that omission of that of that verse, verse thirty seven, an A rating. Um, one of the things that they do um, is they, you know, for any sort of textual variant or any sort of omission, like like we have here in this text, um, it'll it'll give. Um, what shows up in the actual Greek text of how the of how UBS does it, um, you know where that variant is. What they've decided to go with, they give a a a, a letter grade, I guess you could say. So A, B, C, or D, um, with A being confident that that is the true, you know that that's truly what the original is, and then D obviously being on the other side of the spectrum. So the omission of of this verse, verse 37, in the UBS fourth edition is um, is an A rating. So you know the, they believe that that did, that really in the earliest manuscripts that that uh, verse 37 or what's tagged as verse 37 um, wasn't part of the wasn't part of the original text of Acts. Um, you know, but again, if if something like this is trouble uh, troubles you or something like that, uh, again, keep in mind that. Uh, nobody's trying to hide anything. Um, plus, there would be no reason to hide anything like what's said, what what that verse actually says. Because, I mean, if you read it, there's nothing dubious about it. Um, I mean, just as far as the content or the truthfulness of it. Um, you know, not really anyway. I mean, um, you know, it talks about belief and and how there's the confession of the of the eunuch says that he that he believes that uh, Jesus is the Son of God and and things like that. But um, you know, here the translators say, hey, just so you know, um, verse there's a verse thirty seven here. This is what it this is what it says. But that being in the footnote is them pretty much communicating it's probably not part of the original text. Okay, so. There's an openness to that. If there's some sort of conspiracy or anything like that, you wouldn't see things like footnotes in, in your Bibles and things like that. So don't let your heart be troubled over something like that. It's just, um, you know, a lot of people, a lot of very intelligent textual critics um, out there who make comparisons of different manuscripts and who are able to, because we don't have the original, the original autographs, right? So... Um, you know, piecing what we do have together, which is an abundance uh, of, of uh, manuscript material um, that dates way, 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 way back. And piecing those things together, looking at the difference of looking where the variants are and um, being able to determine what comes closest to what the original text actually says. So, um, but anyway, I just thought I would lay that out there I, I, you know if somebody was familiar with it and then noticed that difference and saying and then they thought hmm through this whole thing Steve didn't mention anything about it is he just trying to overlook this sort of thing just kind of sweep it under the rug um, I meant to bring it up um, last time uh, but it slipped my mind and probably because I was really excited to tell you what we were going to be looking at during our uh, during our break from Acts. But speaking of that, of, of the break and the book of Acts, it's going to be interesting because um, when we, after we're done with this this series on the gospel, we and we go back into, um, back into book of, into the book of Acts and pick up in Acts chapter 9, I think, you know, it's just interesting. I, I was just thinking about this the other day. What an appropriate place to start in the book of Acts after talking about the gospel because we're going to look at the conversion of um, of Saul of Tarsus, and you remember what we talked about him and what we saw of him um, in uh, the previous weeks. You know, he was introduced um, back in uh, near the ending part of, of chapter seven. You even see him in chapter in the beginning parts of chapter eight, um, and he is wreaking havoc on the church after the stoning of Stephen, and that great persecution breaks out. And so when we get back into chapter nine, we're going to see him again. And um, I think I mentioned this before, uh, but I, I but I want to mention it again. When we get to that point, when we when we pick up on Acts again, and we pick up on that point, um, and we start to see Saul, I want you I want you to notice the difference, the transformation. Um, you know, the whole thing about transformation, gospel and and transformation, is truly a wonderful thing. 
And I don't know if we're going to talk about this during the during this first set of series of weeks when we talk about the gospel, if this is something that I'm going to pick up later. But the whole thing about transformation, or to use the theological term, uh, regeneration, um, and that's not a well, I sh- that's not like an academic theological term in that sort of sense. That is a biblical term. That that word does show up in scripture, so I'm not ashamed to use it. Um, but basically what we're talking about is the, is the new you, so to speak, uh, from a spiritual point of view, the, the, the new you being a new creature, the old has gone and the new has come. I got to tell you, that's one of those, that's one of those things where, um, uh, where I, I, I don't think that there's a lot of, that there's a lot of understanding, at least from, uh, pockets of of people in the Christian community. There's not a lot of understanding of just how much transformation, how much the the whole thing of regeneration, how much that speaks to everything else about what the Christian does in his or her life on this side of eternity. Because if people really did understand it, this is just this is just how I see things. If people understood of uh, you know the whole thing about regeneration, you wouldn't have people who would say to other pastors and teachers, you shouldn't, you shouldn't teach eternal security because if you teach eternal security, then people are going to be encouraged to just go and sin with impunity um, and they're just going to live sinful, um, wretched lives because they, they're going to think, well, you know, I, you know, I, I don't, I, you know, if, if, I'm, if I'm secure in my salvation, there's nothing that I can do to lose it. So I might as well just go out and uh, party hardy and 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 uh, and sleep around and do all those sorts of things. Such such fears just kind of just kind of unveils the ignorance of of some of the things that are laid out in Scripture as far as the gospel. And this is one of those things where regeneration. If you understand what regeneration is, that fear is unfounded. Now I can understand people from a from a from a non believer's perspective kind of thinking along those lines. I remember I was talking to one. Russian student. This was years ago when I was doing college ministry and I was explaining to him the gospel and uh, I was talking about grace through faith and everything like that and um, how it's not a part of works and, and, and everything. But as I was talking, I think he, in his mind, he got the impression that, well, what this sounds like um, is that you could, that once you accept Christ, when you're saved, you can do whatever you want. And I remember him in, the, in his Russian accent, so that means you can do whatever you want, you know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but it, it, but that's from somebody who doesn't understand, who doesn't come from a spiritual you know set of things. Because remember, the the things of the spirit are spiritually discerned. So if you don't have the spirit, you don't understand these things. Um, but that's where a lot of people who don't believe, that's where their mind goes. You know, and and that's something that I expect. But it, it kind of boggles my mind when you have and when you have people, and not just regular people, you have theologians who say uh, who have said. Um, you know, and they've said in times past, you know, I don't know how popular this is today, but they've they've said things like, well, you shouldn't teach eternal security. And they're not even denying that it's that it's true, that eternal security is true. We're not even talking about somebody who doesn't think that eternal security is a thing. He says, well, you shouldn't teach eternal security in your churches because then that's just going to encourage people to go out and sin. And I just hear that sort of thing, and I think, you don't understand regeneration, do you? If you did, that wouldn't even be a fear, your, a fear in your mind, you know. So we'll we'll get to that point at some, at some point. I don't know if it's going to be on this side of, because what I'm planning to do is when we pick up on Acts, we'll do, we'll do several weeks in Acts when we, when we get back there again. And then the next break, we're probably going to talk about some more things about the gospel, more along the lines of, the effects of the gospel or the things that fit into the gospel of what we have now that we're in Christ. So like regeneration would be one of them. The, the, you know, kind of those, those things that you, uh, that a lot of people talk about, uh, you know, regeneration, sanctification, glorification, you know, those sorts of things. What are those things? And what does that mean? What does that mean for our lives today? Um, that might sound um, somewhat theological, but I got to tell you, we, we got to get into that stuff. You know, some people shy away from doctrine and theology, and when they do that, they end up crippling themselves because they come up with their own um, erroneous theology. That's just the truth of it. I've heard I've heard people say things, and 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 
not teach things, but I mean, they just say things and, you know, you just kind of think that doesn't line up with what scripture says about the gospel and what's true about you now that you're in Christ. And again, it, it comes from this whole thing where I, in my mind, I, I read what some people say, I hear what some people say. I said, look, if you understood this about the gospel, or if you understood that about the gospel, that what you say, you would see how the, what you said there wasn't, was, isn't true. Um, so I hope, so I hope this is, that this is, um, that what we're going to be going through is, I, I definitely, I hope it's going to be encouraging whether, you know, how much you know about the gospel or not, whatever the case may be, wherever you might fall. And again, this might, you know, some people coming into this, they don't, you know, they're, they're don't have a lot of knowledge because they're still immature in the faith and things like that. I under, I understand that. Um, a lot of the things that I that I object to come from people who are supposed to be seasoned in the faith and things like that. And I just scratch my head. I'm like, what in the world? Um, but wherever you might be, whether there's not a lot of uh, understanding of the of the of uh, some of the tremendous truths of the gospel or whether you know a lot about it and um, and things like that. One of the things that I, I truly hope that this that this is 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 deeply, deeply encouraging for you. I think I mentioned that last time. I want this to be a time of encouragement for you. Um, And then also for some people, there just needs to be a little bit more uh, education of what we're dealing with here. And if you feel like you're in that spot, well, then you're in the right place, I think. So let I, I, I whatever the case may be, I'm hoping that this time is going to be incredibly profitable for you. And that's my prayer. You know what? My prayer of this Well, number one, my prayer is that I that I speak this accurately and in a way that's that's that can be understood but secondly i want you i want you and and for me as well because again like i said when i even prepare for things like these and i look through scripture it it, it's it's a blessing on me as well just as i see what scripture says about these things i want this to be an incredible encouragement to you and i hope that this works all the more in continuing to transform your heart transform your mind and therefore transforming your thinking and transforming all of you. And I hope that this leads to that transformation so that you can look more and more like Christ. Okay, that's that's my prayer for you. Last time I asked that you would pray for me as I, as I, as I prepare through this whole thing, I want you to know that my prayer for you is that you that you would be deeply encouraged by by what we're going to look at. Okay. So let's and let's do that throughout through the rest of this time that we're looking at that we're talking about the gospel. Let's pray for each other. OK, let's let's keep one another in prayer. I pr- I'll pray for you and you pray for me. All right. Do we have a deal? All right. So. Just as we get started here, I want to remind you of something. And I and again, I mentioned this last time. I know sometimes I repeat some things one or two times, but I, I want to I want to repeat this again because I, I want this. I think this is important just as we approach this time and as we approach this series. I want to reiterate that what I'm doing here is not laying out a gospel presentation as if this is something where you can just um, regurgitate all of this in, as if this is a gospel presentation. Like I said, we're probably going to be covering quite a bit of ground, so having this as a presentation may not even be realistic. But at the same time, if this is something that you wanted to listen to alongside somebody who might be seeking or something, um, maybe that maybe the two of you can listen to this together and then talk about this. This is just a starting point. This isn't the whole thing itself. Um, you know, this you can use this as a as a discussion piece to kind of talk more about what Scripture says about the things that that we talk about on this program, okay? Um, but this isn't this isn't something where you say, where I'm saying okay, when you speak the gospel to somebody, this passage is exactly where you need to go, and this is where you need to start, and this is what you need to say. Um, that's that's not what that is, not what this is. So I want to reiterate that. Um, you know, just it's, I think it's important for you for you to know that um, this is just delving into scripture and just getting in and just seeing what does the Bible say about the gospel? What are some what are some things that we can be encouraged by? What are some of the things that we miss about the gospel? And trust me, there are things that are missed. Um, I think I mentioned before how there's that uh, like when I spoke at that revival meeting several years ago, um, how there are people. And again, these weren't new Christians. Um, these were people who had been believers for a while, but they say, man, we've never heard anything like this before. And I'm like, I, I don't know how something like that happens. 
I, I and and again, and, I, and one of the things that I said is that the pastor at our at our church has heard the same thing when he's preached some things about the gospel. And for both for the both of us, we just kind of think, like, well, what's going on? And it's and it's left us asking the question: What is being taught in our churches? You know what 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 are, what are we spending a lot of time on? And again, I, I said it, that that this isn't. I, it's, this isn't me saying that I believe that that the gospel itself and the theology behind the gospel and things like that should be the topic of every single sermon um, on Sunday mornings. But the gospel is so central to our lives and who we are in Christ that I, you would think that there would there would be a lot of mention of it. So it just kind of it kind of it kind of threw me for a well, sort of threw me for a loop. I know that there are some people who uh, have expressed. Um, uh, you know, just kind of things where we've never heard this before. I don't know if you've if, if you've ever listened to um, Paul Washer and listened to any of his sermons, but he's he's been one who is who has said that when it comes to the gospel, he's had some people who have mentioned that to him before. Um, but I mean, as far as what I experienced, that's the first time that I'd ever heard anybody address that to me about something that I that I had actually said and something that I had actually taught on, um, and so. It's one of those. It's that's. It's a situation like that where I understand where, what Paul Washer experienced. You know, just kind of having. Like, We've never heard anything like this before, and I don't know how that happens really. Um, so, anyway, um, let's. I told you that when we get started with this, what we're going to do is we're. Go- it's not going to take the regular form of, you know. God loves you. Has a wonderful plan for your life. But there's a, something in the way, and it's called sin, that sort of thing. I think when we, when it comes to examining something like this, what we need to do is we need to we need to talk about who God is. Now that's a broad subject. That in itself can take several weeks. Okay, and that's and we're not going to do that, right? Um, yeah. You know, it. But what I'm not talking about here is is starting out by doing a study, a, a, a lengthy study of the attributes of God. Um, but I, I do want to bring up some attributes of God that, that will work well in directing us in the direction that we want to go as far as examining the gospel and the implications on our lives today. Okay. And, and as I was preparing for this, I was, I was kind of struggling a little bit again, and just kind of wondering where to go and where to start and things like that. I could go here, I could talk about this. Uh, and everything, and I, I finally, I think, with the Lord's help, I, I narrow things down to a particular passage that I want to look at because this passage talks about, um, you know, very important attributes of God that that gives us a clear understanding of why the gospel is so important and why God did what He did in sending His Son. Okay, and that passage is in Isaiah six, and basically, what we're going to be looking at here primarily. Uh, we're going to be talking about God in His holiness, um, which, you know, holiness. When we when we get to this this whole thing of holiness, um, if you're familiar with this part of Scripture, where where Isaiah has a vision of God in the temple, sitting on the throne, high and exalted and lifted up, and you have this uh, have the seraphim there, um, who are saying, "Holy, holy, holy." Um, you know, that's you know, th- this that was quite a scene. For Isaiah, especially when you get a load of how he reacted to everything that he saw, that that wasn't something where he could just shrug things off and say, "Wow, this is some this is something else." I mean, Isaiah flipped out to kind of use a <laughs> to kind of maybe give a, a a a current vernacular to it, I guess. And even that, well, I don't know. Even thinking that, I don't know if that's the right term to use. Um, there was definitely a lot of internal turmoil just as he comes into contact with a perfectly holy and, per- and a perfectly righteous God. But when we concentrate on who God is as it relates to his holiness, as it relates to his glory, and even as it relates to his authority, um, and if we as as people, as human beings, understand what that is, and maybe if we've even ex- you know, come in contact with those sorts of things before, I think we understand um, you know, just kind of the, the wide cleft uh, there was uh, between somebody like God and somebody like us, okay? 
and it's going to really bring out the whole problem of sin all the more uh, all the all the more strongly, I think. And and again, it did for Isaiah. Isaiah Isaiah um, encountered the you know the 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 perfect holiness of God, and he says, "I'm essentially saying I'm coming apart at the seams. I'm done. I'm finished." You know. That's what happens when somebody has a close encounter with God. And as I'm going to explain later, that doesn't necessarily have to be in the form of seeing something like Isaiah did and experiencing something, seeing smoke and and, and being in an earthquake just as he's in the presence of God. You might read something like that and you might think, well, of course, Isaiah was undone. Of course, Isaiah reacted the way that he did. Um, But as I'll show you later, you don't necessarily have to have um, a situation just like that in order to become in contact with 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 a, 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 a true understanding of the holiness of God in, in comparison to who you are to have that kind of that kind of thought of wow this I am who am I compared to this wonderful God okay so we're only going to be looking at the the first uh, well let me turn there first I'm still in acts. <laughs> Uh, gotta pry myself away from Acts. We'll get back there, but um, in in Isaiah chapter six, um, I'm just I'm just uh, looking at the first um five verses primarily, and I know there is more to the story, like in in verses uh, in verses six and following as well. But for our purposes, just to set the stage for where we're going in this examination of the gospel, I think that I think verses one through five are very key here. It really magnifies for us in a very significant way this God who we worship. And I think it's important for us to know and it's important for us to realize that this God that we're looking at in, in Isaiah six is the same God that exists today. God does not change. You know, we look at things like this and we say, well, of course, this is Old Testament stuff. And Isaiah's reaction here to what he sees of God, well, of course he reacted that way. As, this is Old Testament stuff. When we knew that God was was uh, uh, kind of uh, angry all the time, <laughs> you know, I think some people think that. Listen, God, God is the same God in the Old Testament just as he is now today in the New Testament era. Nothing's changed. His holiness hasn't changed. His feelings about his holiness hasn't changed. His standards, his glory, nothing has changed. So if something like this were to happen today, you'd get the same response. Okay, so I, I want to make that clear, and I might mention that again here and there as we go down uh, as we go down the road here, because it's going to be important for us to understand. It's especially important for us to understand here since we're looking at an Old Testament text. Now, you do see a lot of things with wrath and vengeance and things like that, but you also see... Um, a, a lot of love, encouragement, forgiveness. I mean, if you really take the time to read the Old Testament, you see both sides of the coin there. But anyway, I don't want to. I don't want to go off on a on a rabbit trail there. But um, I think it's just important for us to understand. So let me read the. Let me read these verses here, verses one through verses one through five, and then we'll talk about it. Okay. So this and again, this is Isaiah six. It says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the of the thresholds shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Okay, so that's that's quite a scene. You know, it's I, I, I kinda think it, it would it would kind of be like if if Isaiah were alive today. Um, and he's trying to describe this. I, I, I get the sense that, you know, this would be one of those things where if somebody were in this situation, they would just say, dude, you, you just you just had to would have had to have been there, <laughs> you know, just to really to really pick up on on this whole dude. You just you just would have had to have been there. I mean, this this seems like a scene where um, 
not enough words could could be used to really fully capture um, what is what really happened there and what Isaiah experienced in coming in contact with a holy God. Now, the language here that's written out here, um, you know, inspired by the Holy Spirit, of course, I mean, you you read those words and you think that, wow, that is something else. But you kind of wonder, what was it like for Isaiah? I mean, you know what it's like just based on the description. But I mean, even, you know, just reading it, I don't think we have a grasp of just kind of what Isaiah was feeling at that time. You want to get get a good description, of a, a good just summary of, 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 of Isaiah and what he felt, the emotions he felt? Terrified. He was terrified out of his mind in a way that you probably can't describe. So what do we have here when we go back when we go back to this to the beginning of this passage here and it talks about you know he gives the setting of time this is in the year that that king Uzziah died and you know we don't have to go too much into that I mean just based on some of the things that have been happening before in this prophecy something like that bit of information is is pretty important you know Israel is 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 kind of going through some uh, some spiritual um, uh, some spiritual decline and uh, it's it's not looking good for them but somebody like King Uzziah who was a righteous king uh, for the most part uh, you know he reigned uh, for a little over 50 years and through that time there had been um, for most of that time there had been great a great deal of stability it seemed like and now uh, his life has come to an end his life didn't end very well he was a righteous king uh, both Kings and Chronicles says that but in Chronicles, we see the whole thing where he, he, he where God kind of, uh, not kind of, he did um, inflict him with leprosy um, because he tried to, I believe he tried to burn incense at the altar and tried to take the duty of what priests are only able to do. So that was his ending, and he kind of died in seclusion because, uh, because of his leprosy and, and everything like that. But um, So it was an unfortunate end, but his reign was a reign that... that uh, that brought a lot of stability, and now he's gone. So this is with the year that King Uzziah died. We're talking 740 B.C. And um, in that year, um, Isaiah says that, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. So one of the, th- the f- one thing that one of the things that I want you to realize about this picture one of the things that we see about God is we see God in all of his authority, okay? We think about throne, we think about a king. We think about a king, we think about a king who is, is somebody who is in authority, somebody who reigns, right? You know, we, you know, and, and when you read through the Bible, I mean, the context of the times when the Bible was written, both in the Old and the New Testament, is monarchy, Right? Now, you know, we have to we have to set ourselves, our minds in that mindset when we read scripture, because living in a democratic republic like we do, um, that's not how our our government is set up. Uh, We don't we don't elect a king. We don't aren't ruled by a king. We elect a president to represent us. You know, so it's it's somewhat different when you have a king. The king is the one who calls all the shots. Um, and everybody, their responsibility is to say absolutely right away, your wish is my command, whatever, whatever the heck people said, <laughs> you know, in, in obedience to the king. That's, that's what they were supposed to do. Unbending, wavering uh, uh, obedience. Now, of course, we do obey our government leaders. The, our president is a leader in, in some sense. But, I mean, again, a monarchy versus a democratic republic is, um, is vastly different. So, you know, when we see God and God is described as a king, you know, people who even today live in countries where there's where there's a king, uh, you know, have a lot of a lot of. Well, you have countries that do have kings sometimes, but sometimes those kings don't have any sort of authority. But when you when you think about a king who rules over a nation or reigns over over a land of some sort, he is he is the top cheese. All right. And in some of those cases and some of those kingdoms. You don't do what the king says; it's off with your head. Um, you know that's the, you know the absolute power and authority that a king had over a land. Okay, so when you think about God as king, we think about this is God who rules and He reigns. Now, this is going to be important to think about um, when we think about God and authority and 
when we think about us and who we are in our sinfulness, we are we we rebel when we sin. We rebel against a king. Now, again, if you think about that in in biblical terms and in Bible times, you think that's that's a big deal. It's a big deal to to be rebellious against the king uh, that's ruling over your land. Okay, so we have here. We see, we see that 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 Isaiah sees the Lord. Now it's not it's not a physical form. God is spirit. Um, you know, the only thing that's really described here is the train of his robe, and we'll talk about that here in a second. Um, but you, you know, there's re- there's has never really there's never been an, any description of God because God can't be described in physical form. I've heard people in the past describe God's physical characteristics, physical attributes, but these are people who don't know what they're talking about, and they're speaking error. You know, in John 4, it says that God is spirit, right? He, he doesn't have a physical form. Even when you read, uh, when you read about John, uh, when you read John in his vision um, of, of heaven um, in Revelations chapter 4 and 5, in Revelation chapter 4 and 5, you notice that there's that there's that John sees a throne, but there's no description of anybody who's sitting on the throne. Lest we lest we become idolatrous and thinking of something of God that he is not, right? But here we see that Isaiah is, uh, you know, he sees that the Lord is sitting on a throne, and those are just anthropomorphisms because again, God is God is spirit. God doesn't sit on anything. The Lord is sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And that's something that was that was common with monarchs. They had long um, trains um, of their of their uh, of their robes, which kind of really magnified the the majesty um, of 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 who they were. And so, with that being the case, when we're talking about the the train of of God, of the Lord's robe that filled the temple. I mean, we're talking about a huge train, and it filled the whole temple. Now, what is now, what are we talking about with the temple here? I mean, is this the the temple on earth, or is this something else? Um, you know, there's been some talk back and forth whether this is the actual temple that stood, or whether this is a vision in the heavenly temple. Listen, we don't have to we don't have to nitpick and all of that. The whatever the case may be, we're talking about Isaiah being in a spot where he's in the presence of the Lord in a in a temple whether it's the earthly temple in his vision or whether he's in the heavenly temple um, of which the things on earth are a, rep, uh, are a replica of, of, of a replica or representation of what's above. Uh, we see that the train of, of God's robe fills the temple. Like I said, that's big and that speaks to the greatness of God's majesty. Okay, so so try and see as best as you can, try and see how this looks through through Isaiah's eyes. This is this is something big. This is huge. And then in verse two, it says, "Above him stood the seraphim, and the seraphim are just an order of angels." And it gives a description of this. It says, "Each had each had six wings. Two had uh, with two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew." Okay, so there's six wings, and look at what look at what they do with these with these wings. Like it says, with two he covered his uh, he covered his face. Why? Because they're in the presence of the glorious uh, of the glorious Lord, they can't they can't withstand the glory that is shining forth from from uh, from the presence of the Lord, which is kind of interesting when we're talking about righteous righteous angels such as these. We're dealing with righteous angels here, okay? Now, righteous angels do they have any sin in them? No. Do righteous angels sin? No. But yet, even even they, even they, as created creatures who have not sinned have to cover their face because they cannot behold you know the 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 true magnificence of the god that they that they that they attend to i think that's amazing so if that's the case with angels i mean what do you think it is for 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 a normal human being like 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 us or like isaiah here in this text right so with two wings he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet. A lot I've heard a lot of people say that that speaks of humility. You know, which I mean, uh, yeah. If you're if you're in the presence of a of a of a majestic holy God in His presence, that's that's going to bring you down several pegs, probably. 
Um, and that's what that was supposed to represent. And with two, he flew. So that was the other two. It's just the way that he was mobile, flew around as he attended to, as he attended to God's business. Now, verse three, now here's, here's a lot of the clincher here. When we're talking about, when we start out with talking about the gospel, and like I said before, I wanted to start this out by examining who God is. Who is God? I think I, I truly think that when we start at that point, we, we, we kind of open up the, the clarity of the whole thing all the more. Who is God? Well, these seraphim here are going, are going to tell us, at least you know, in, in some sense here. They don't go into a list of attributes of who God is, but notice what it says here in verse 3. It says, And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. All right. So I told you we'd be talking about the holiness of God and what that's all about. Now, here's the thing. We talk about who God is or what kind of God we serve. If we were to go out and we were to do a survey um, of Christians in the church, um, we might, you know, and we ask the question, what kind of what what kind of God do you serve? What what it, who, what kind of God is He? I'm pretty sure that a lot of the a lot of the things that would be on the top of the list, this would probably be the number one answer. If there, if we were doing a survey for for Family Feud, um, this would probably be the number one answer on the board. He's a loving God, or you know, He's a kind God. He's a good God. He's a merciful God. The love is probably would probably be the one there on the top of the list. Now, of course, of course, that's all true. That is all true. But what I want us to realize, though, let well, let me let me ask this. Let me let me ask it in this way. How many people, if we were to do a survey of people in the church, how many people would you come up with where their first response of, of who God is? would answer and say that he is a holy God. That would be the number one thing that they mention. Now, of course, I don't know for sure. I'm just making guesses here. But I, but I would be one to guess that the holiness of God wouldn't even show up in the top five, maybe not even in the top ten. I don't think the holiness of God is something that, that really, it really sticks out in the forefront of our minds. And yet that says something. I mean, because when we think about that and we think about Scripture and, and even how the holiness of God is presented here, we come in contact with something that's very significant. Because you notice what the seraphim are saying. They say, holy, holy, holy. Now, in Jewish literature, when, when anybody wanted to emphasize something, they repeated it three times. So this was something where, where the seraphim are really emphasizing this. They didn't just say, holy is the Lord of hosts, although that's true. If they just said holy just once, it still would have been a true statement, right? But they say, holy, holy, holy. That's, that's, that's put there for emphasis. And it would be interesting for us to know that the, whole, that, that the holiness of God, that's the only attribute that's expressed like that in scripture. So you don't have love, love, love. You don't have mercy, mercy, mercy. You don't have good, good, good. You know, is God love? Is God love? Yes. God merciful? Yes. Is God good? Yes. So nothing, nothing to say any, saying these things isn't, isn't denying any of those things. But man, look at where the emphasis is put. This is the only characteristic. This is the only attribute where you have that that threefold repetition. Holy, holy, holy. And that's intentional. And that's for emphasis. That that whole thing of holiness. And really what they're doing when they're communicating that is that th- I got to be careful how to describe this here because I don't, I don't know if it's I don't think it's right to say that that his holiness is better than all his other attributes. That's not what I'm trying to say, but it, it, it transcends, I guess, um, that, uh, you know, what all those, all the other characteristics of God. And really a lot of the, a lot of the, um, a lot of what you have as far as the attributes of God are very 
tightly linked to the holiness of God. So that when you talk about the love of God, it is a holy love. When you talk about the goodness of God, it is, it is a it is a it is a holy goodness. All right. So even in that, you see that his ho- that his holiness is is linked to all the other things that that make up who God is. So you have this whole thing where he says where he says holy, holy, holy. Now, let's talk about the word holy for a second. What are we talking about when we're talking about holy? If we're saying that that the Lord is holy. As these seraphim are saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. What's being said there? What's being said there is that God, let me put it in, in, in short form. We can, we can kind of describe this in a couple of ways that are kind of linked together. And you kind of see this as, um, as his otherness, I guess. God is a God who is totally other. He's not like us. He's unique. He's unlike any of his of his creatures, right? He's not like you and me. And listen, that's important. That's important to understand. That's a, that's an important fact that we need to that we need to staple to our hearts and minds. Because that's I think that's one of the big problems with with man, even both inside and outside the church. We have to be careful of this because a lot of times it, the temptation is to think that God is like us or God acts like us, or God does the same things that we do. You know, in, uh, in, uh, um, in Psalm 50, verse 20, um, in, in, in the psalm is God speaking, he's saying, you thought I was altogether like you, but I will rebuke you, or, you know, or something to that effect. But the, I, but the whole thing was, you thought that I was altogether like you, and the implication behind that is that you are sorely mistaken. You are sorely mistaken. You know, that's why you have, you know, one of the, it's interesting that um, it's interesting that, you know, you have uh, people who raise objections to the things of God as they do. I mean, again, obviously, we're talking about from the from the non-Christian point of view, you know, some people who who uh, who may have read the Bible and they reject God. They they just don't like the things that show up about God in, in Scripture. And I think. Underneath the surface of that, I mean, I don't, it's nothing that's ever explicitly expressed, but really I think below the surface is one of those things where it's a, where they look at God and they say that God is not like me and I can't serve a God like that. You may have some people who acknowledge God for who he is and they think that they serve the right God. But then when you open up scripture and say, this is what God is. And this is what the Bible says about him here, 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 and here. They say, that's not my God. But they say, well, yes, it is. But they say, no, that's not my God. I can't, I can't serve a God like that. Well, of course, because you're looking for a God that's just like you. See, that's the problem. That's a problem with a lot of people. When it comes to, when it comes to talking about sin before coming to Christ, even if you have any sort of religious thought or any thinking about who God is, I think that's one of the biggest hangups. And again, like I said, when any any sort of objection that somebody might have about God and how he's expressed and how he's described in the Bible, you know, people might might be offended by some of those things. They might be offended that that God comes across as angry and he wipes out a whole uh, community of people. But you know what lies underneath the surface of that? It says that's not how I would do it. If I were in his place, I wouldn't do that. I would be I would be more merciful than that. That's somebody, you know, saying that, you know, that, you know, that, you know, that God needs to be more like me. Now, for people who don't object to God or maybe people who think that they're on God's side when they're not, you know, the whole thing is, is that, you know, they, they, when they look at God, they think that God does the same things that they do. And let me, let me put it this way. This is one of the reasons, this is one of the reasons why people, why some people get angry with God. And I, and again, I was, I would even say that this is something that happens in the church as well. I don't think any of us are immune to the the whole thing of getting angry at God. I don't know of anybody in the, in, in the world who's a believer who, who may not, who doesn't admit that they've, that they've been mad at God before. Now that's sin, but really how does that come about? I mean, usually it comes about in a situational sort of setting where something happens and we are, uh, you know, God, we feel that God didn't come through the way that we wanted him to, or we're going through something and we don't understand why. 
And we know that God is up there watching. We know that, that God is in control of things, and yet, you know, things aren't working out the way that we want it to. And we get mad at God. Now, underneath the surface, what is that communicating in an indirect way? Not only the fact that we think that God is doing us wrong, which, oh gosh, I mean, to even think that. And again, I've thought that before, so I mean, I, I identify with that. But um, in an indirect way, what we're saying is that, God, if I were in your place, I would not do it like this. I would do it the right way. Right. I mean, isn't that isn't that what isn't that what we what we were saying indirectly if we, if we get mad at God? And so, you know what we're doing when we do that? We, we engage in idolatry. Either we say or either in our thinking, we say God is like us. He thinks like us. He does the same things that we do. And that's the God that I like to see. Or we say God should not be like this. He should be like this and this and this. So either we think that God is like us or we think that God is wrong in what he's doing and he needs to be more like us. I mean, yikes. I mean, just saying that just kind of just kind of like, oh, wow. Do we say that sometimes? Well, the words might not come out of our mouths. But I think if we really examine our hearts and, and understand where our thoughts and our feelings come from, sometimes I think that's what we're saying in an indirect sense, Right. That offends, listen, that offends God's holiness. That offends his holiness because he is totally other. He's not like you and he's not like me. God is unlike anybody or anything in this world. That's why in, in Exodus 15, after after the uh, after the Israelites, Israelites crossed the Red Sea, as part of the song that they sung, they said, who is like you? Majestic in holiness, Right? The thought behind that saying is that there is nobody like you. No, God is like you. And I think that's really what they had on their minds because really God really showed up all the other gods that everybody in Egypt worshipped. But really, it, 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 that, that covers all aspects of, of creation. He's not like you. He's not like me. He's not like his creation. And he's far superior to any other God that's invented in the minds of man. That's what you have. But his holiness, when we talk about holiness, holy is the Lord. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. We're also, we also talk about his separateness. He is separated from this. And we're talking, when we talk about this, we're talking about he's, uh, you know, in this separateness, he's separated from anything that's impure or blemished or anything like that. He is perfectly pure. He's perfectly righteous. I mean, he is set apart from anything that has to do with sin. Now, I think we understand that to a, to a certain degree. I mean, you look in any Bible track, you you know, you see the bridge illustration. You see the whole thing of man on one side of a cliff, and then God on the other side. And there's the the whole gulf that that separates the two is 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 sin. But really, in in some sense, that's that's true. I'm not saying that that's not true. Um, but again, uh, you know, just think about how Isaiah kind of just kind of presents this whole thing because he he understands the separateness. You get that sense because of how he reacts to being in the presence of God. Okay? God in all of his perfection uh, is, um, you know, just kind of blasts away anything that Isaiah may have thought of himself as far as being a good person. And Isaiah says that I'm undone. Now you get the whole picture of the of the separateness of God. You know, just when you just look at the at the um, at how things were set up in the temple or in the tabernacle or in the temple, for example, that veil that separated the holy place from the most holy place. It's a picture of separation, of holiness. God is too holy for us to, to come into His presence with sin. I mean, if you think about the the Day of Atonement. That's the only time in the whole year that somebody could go into the most holy place where the ark was and which was serves, was serves as a, rep- a representation of the presence of God that sat on the mercy seat between the two cherubim on the on the in the ark of the Co- on the ark of the covenant. And when somebody comes in there, now, now let's say that somebody didn't come there on the on the day of the atonement, they just walked behind that curtain. They they'd be done for. They're gone. 
You didn't just you didn't just walk into walk into the presence of God like that. It's only once a year during the Day of Atonement. It was only by the high priest. And he couldn't go in there empty handed. He had to go in there with blood. All of this, all of that speaks of separation from a holy God. A holy God that cannot con that it cannot be in the presence of sinful man. Relationally, I should say, as well. I mean, God is om- uh, is omnipresent. He's everywhere. But I mean, as far as as far as you know, just his his uh, re- relational presence with us, that's not possible without blood. And that's what that day represented. That what that's what that day showed, and it showed the the constant problem of sin. Um, it showed the constant problem of sin, uh, just as uh, uh, they would, this was something that they would have to do year after year after year after year after year after year. It was a reminder of their of their of their sinfulness. Okay, and so that's what you have when you talk when when we're talking about his holiness, his separation, set apart. From anything having to do with sinful man. So, you have this threefold repetition: holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. And notice what it says here. It says after that, the whole earth is full of His glory. And notice that the whole earth is full of His glory, not just the temple where Isaiah is seeing these things. The whole earth is full of His glory. Now, what is glory? When we talk about glory, glory is the, this manifestation of, of his attributes and his perfections. Really, when you talk about the glory of God, that's what, that's what you have there. You may be familiar with Psalm 19.1, the heavens declare the glory of God, right? Romans 1.20, when it talks about um, you know, the, the, his, um, his eternal attributes, namely his, his divine power. Um, and, well, let me read that. I want to read that. Uh, because I think that that speaks well to the whole thing of, of God's glory. Um, in, uh, in Romans chapter 1, um, Romans chapter 1, verse, verse 20, for his invisible attributes. So remember we said his glory is the manifestation of his attributes. His invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. Okay, so his invisible his invisible attributes. We think of invisible. We think of something that we that we don't see, but his invisible attributes are displayed in uh, the wonder of creation. And really, that says a lot about who God is when we see that in when we see God's handiwork in creation. If you think about the psalmist in Psalm chapter eight, he says, "When I look at the sun, the moon, the heaven, and the stars, I think, who is man that you are mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him? That's the that that's the language of somebody who sees the wonder of God's power in creation, and he realizes how small he is, right? But when we get to the whole thing of of God's glory and coming in contact with his holiness and his glory. We're not even only talking about realizing how small we are and compared to how uh, to, in, in compared in comparison to who God is. But even again, when we when we're going through this whole thing of the gospel, you understand how how sinful we are. And one of the things that we learn if we go back to the passage in Isaiah is that when one of the things that we learn is that when you see somebody who is in who is it comes in contact with the perfectly holy and righteous God, you see somebody who, who who's just laid bare and his sins are on full display before his own eyes. And he's like, oh my goodness, I, you know, how can I stand in the presence of this holy God? You become keenly aware of who you are as a sinner. That's what happened with, that's what happened with Isaiah. Now, as you read in verse in verse four, you know, it says, and the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called and the house was filled with smoke. And kind of it sounds a lot like a lot, a lot like Mount Sinai. If you read uh, in Exodus 19, when the presence of God came down and there was uh, on Mount Sinai and there was smoke and there was an earthquake, the Israelites were scared out of their minds. 
And after God spoke to them the Ten Commandments, they were so frightened, they said to Moses, said, listen, if God speaks again, we're, we're going to die. So you speak to him, and then you tell us what he told you, and then whatever he says for us to do, we'll obey. It was a very freaky scene for all of them. And so you kind of get it, it's similar. I mean, not exact, obviously, but it kind of is a similar scene that you see here in verse 4 of, of, of Isaiah chapter 6. And then in verse 5, we've already alluded, alluded to it several times, but in verse 5 it says, And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king. I've seen the one who's in authority, and who will I disobey? If we're talking about somebody who is, who is, uh, uh, who is, uh, who realizes his sinfulness, he realizes his disobedience against the king, the one who's in authority. He says, for my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. So Isaiah gets his, gets his sin. Now he says, he says, in the, he says, woe is me. That means cursed am I, damned am I, condemned am I. Woe is me. Woe is me. For I am lost. And that, that term for I am lost is kind of a mild way of putting the translation there. Like, again, like I said, it's, it's, it's essentially what he's saying is like, I'm becoming undone. I'm coming apart at the scenes. I'm melting. I mean, whatever you want to say to kind of give it that extra umph, that's really what Isaiah is trying to communicate there. That's what he's, that's what he's trying to communicate. And one of the things that he sees in him in in large part, he says, therefore, I am a man of unclean lips. Now, think about this. Isaiah was a prophet. He used his lips a lot. And even with his lips, he saw his his condition as utterly sinful. He says, I'm a man of unclean lips. In other words, he says, I have a foul mouth. Now, if we're talking about somebody who is who has the prophet has a prophetic office, you know, what we see is that Isaiah understands that even in the even in the things that he says, even in the things that he tries to do for God, he says that, man, it just seems just dirty now. Now, you know, some people might come to Isaiah's defense and they might say, oh, Isaiah, you're being a little bit too hard on yourself here. You are um, you're, you're, you're taking this too hard. You, you shouldn't think of yourself like that. You know, you're you're probably a cut above everybody else in this nation. You know, because listen, he even said he said, I dwell among an, a, a people of unclean lips. So I'm in the midst of these people. But somebody might say, yeah, but but Isaiah, you're you're a cut above everybody else. I mean, especially given your prophetic office and the things that you do. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think you know, I don't think you're that bad. I don't think you're 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 that unworthy. I mean, come, you know, cut yourself some slack here. And notice that God in this passage, or even in the verses that follow, we're not going to look at the verses that follow, where God doesn't disagree with anything that Isaiah said. I mean, God doesn't say that. God doesn't say, well, you know, hey, hold on, don't, don't, be, don't be too rough on yourself here. You don't, you don't hear any disagreement from God, from the throne, or from the seraphim, or from anybody else, which shows you the truthfulness, the reality of, of Isaiah's condition before, before a holy God. Now, we might look at this, we might think, okay, well, that's all well and good. But, I mean, look at the scene. The foundations were shaking, there was smoke. You know, you know how, can, how can people in the 21st century identify with something like that? I mean, in other words, we would say, it would seem like in, in order to get a sense of the sinful, our sinfulness in the presence of a holy God, we would have to be in the same situation as Isaiah, and it has to be something that's that's blazing. It has to be something that's glorious. It's got to be something that's going to, when we see it, it knocks us off our feet. That might be what we think. That's not necessarily the case. You think about Peter, for example. Now, Peter had been out in his boat fishing all night and hadn't caught a thing, right? And after Jesus gets done preaching a sermon, he tells Simon, "Go out and, and cast your net into uh, cast your net into the lake on this side." And Peter says, "We've been out all night. We haven't caught a thing. But because you say so, this is in Luke five. But because you say so, I will let down the nets." And what happened? They pulled in so much fish that the boats began to sink. 
it was it was beyond anything that any of them had been used to as far as a good day's catch. And so what was Peter's response? Wow, this is really cool. All right, man. No. He falls before Jesus and says, go away from me, Lord. I'm a sinful man. Now, was there any sort of lightning? Was there any sort of thunder, uh, earthquake or anything like that? No, he's he falls at the feet of a God who is who is veiled in human flesh. Right. He's he's bowing down before somebody who looks like an ordinary person that you might bump into when you're walking down the street. He got a sense of his sinfulness in the presence of a God who displayed himself in his power in 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 a very um in a very amazing way. And when you see that power, before Peter was seeing the power of God in such a magnificent way that he said, "Oh, my goodness, he got he got he got a good look at his own sinfulness just by that display of power. And he really understood uh, in, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a little more gradual sense who, who Jesus was compared to who he, who he himself was. Now again, that might seem that might sound a more uh, magnificent than what we might see today. Well, I don't know about that. I mean, I think God does amazing things in our lives. I think so. I think for a lot of times, though, we just don't pay attention. And so we don't behold the glory of God. We don't behold the you know, we don't behold his majesty. We don't behold his power because we're just not paying attention. God's power is displayed all the time. God does things all the time. And sometimes every once in a while, he'll catch a, he'll catch us in a time where we see something that God does and we're and it, and it catches us by surprise. Now. Let me let me give you let me give you an example of what I mean by this. Um, and this happened to me um, not too long ago. Um, and I'll, I'll try and keep this story as short as possible. But um, I had a doctor's appointment that I needed to go to. And um, I just uh, signed up for for new insurance, health insurance. And I was going to a new doctor. It was a doctor that somebody from somebody from our church um, recommended. And so um, he said, so I, I made an appointment and everything, and they said, okay, great. Be sure to bring your insurance card and everything. I said, great. And so I looked in my wallet just to make sure that I, I had my card because I had it the day before because I used it to get the information on there to, to create an account online. And I couldn't, I couldn't find it in there. And I thought, huh, I thought I put it in there. So I'll, but I think I know where I left it. If it's not my wallet, I know it's here. So I went to look there. And I didn't see it there. And so I started to look all around. And before you knew it, I was just looking all over the place. And I was thinking, man, I, I don't know where that card is. It, it, it only it could have only been in a few places just based on how, you know, where I was uh, in the house that day and, and what I'd been doing and things like that. I didn't know where else it could be, but I could not find that card anywhere. And it really upset me. And when I say it upset me, I'm not saying it, I was distraught. I was mad. I mean, I was really mad. And it was it was an anger that as it was welling up inside of me, I realized it was an anger that was not good. You know, a lot of people call me a, a cool cucumber. And maybe for the most part, that's true. But I mean, when when there's anger that that wells up to a certain level, I, I, I notice it because I, I, I don't get there some a lot of times. Um, but I was really, really upset and um, and e- even in my upsetness, I was I was praying to God and asking God, let me, will you please, uh, show me where my insurance card is? And you know, I I was still looked around, I couldn't find it anywhere. And um, you know, I eventually did get to my appointment. I I uh, I downloaded an app and was able to pull up my card on there and and everything like that. There's a lot of things, elements that go to the story that would make it long, and a lot of the details aren't necessary for what I'm trying to tell you, but let it be known that I was upset about it. I was really upset. Now, and I look back on that, I was I was thinking that God may have uh, orchestrated that situation to bring to my attention things in my heart that were not good, that I needed to take care of, that I needed to confess, and I needed to turn over to God. I was telling uh, somebody about that, the, that, that later on that night, um, what had gone on and just kind of how I, I thought, you know what, I think God may have orchestrated that to, to you know, just kind of serve as a check engine light in my life, um, you know, just to just to bring to my attention the attitudes in my heart that aren't good. 
Um, but that's not that's not the pinnacle of the story. Now, here's the thing that you have to understand. Here's what you have to know. And when I was searching for that card and I was looking all over the place, I looked in my wallet initially, of course, and I said that and I saw that it wasn't in there. Even in my franticness and trying to find that card, I I open up my wallet. Listen, not twice, not three times, not four times. I would say at least five times, maybe even six. And each time I open up my wallet to look again, there was a part of me that was thinking, I, there's no, there's, there's no use looking in my wallet again. I've looked, I've looked several times. It's just not in there, but I would look anyway. And I would take stuff out. I would, I would take everything out. I would take the cards out. I would take everything, lay it out there. I'm looking for it. I just don't see it anywhere. I put stuff back in and then I would check again as if it was somehow I expected it to magically appear. And, um, you know, I just go, I just ruffle through everything and I can't find it. And, and the more I, I keep looking and the more I can't find it, the more frustrated I get. Um, and so I, I obviously I didn't find the card that day. Now, fast forward to the next day or, or the, probably the day after next. So it was in the first couple of days after that whole thing happened. It was in the morning. I was leaving the house and, um, as I'm as I'm walking out the door, I have my wallet out and I'm looking for something. It's something else, um, and I know it's in there because I saw it in the in the mad uh, um, in the mad dash. I was when I was uh, trying to find my insurance card. But as I was pulling out what I was looking for, I looked. I saw something, and I said, "What is this?" And I look and I pull it out, and there, right there in my wallet, in one of the pockets, was my insurance card. Now I remember, <laughs> I remember I was just standing there and, and, and I, I, I couldn't move. I just stood there and I just, I was just looking at my card. Now listen, in oversight and looking in your wallet for something and not seeing things, you know, when something is in front of your face, I could see that happening once, maybe even twice when you look again, but five times, six times. That's unnatural. And like I said, I took everything out. I was looking through everything. It would, Folks, when I was looking through my wallet, it was not there. I promise you it was not there. And so when I, when I, so as I'm standing there that morning looking at my insurance card, I'm just overwhelmed. And in my mind, it confirmed what I believed God was trying to do in that situation. And so what I, what I believed at that time, and I believe right now, is that God deliberately, listen, he deliberately blinded my eyes so that I would not be able to see that card. I don't think my card was lost. I just think my card was there the whole time. My card was in that wallet the whole time. Every time I checked, I truly believe that God prevented me miraculously from seeing that card. And why not? God's done stuff like that before in the Bible, not in situations that are similar to mine. The context is different, but God has blinded, blinded people's eyes from seeing things that are, that are there. And just really coming to terms with the intervention of God in that, in that way, it just did something to me. I remember I just stood there and I couldn't move and I was just like, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness, it's... Is that the God that I'm dealing with? The God who, for his own purposes and his purposes for my life, closed my eyes to something that was right there in front of me. I don't know if that, if that really, if that really conjures up anything in your heart and your mind. It's, it's, it's one of those things, like I said before, with what I, what Isaiah might've said about his situation. I kind of say the same thing. You had to, you had to have been there and it had to have happened to you. It's just one of those things where it's just like, my goodness, what kind of God am I dealing with here? And it's just, and it just froze me. It just froze me. And it, and it brought out all the more just kind of this realization of I am not a person that I need to be before this holy God. That's something that happened to me recently. I still think about that and I, and it still, and it still gets me. Um, but you know, the power of God to the point that he prevents me from seeing something that 
in normal human life, I, I should have seen. It, I mean, it, there's I couldn't have missed that card, but I did. Not once, not twice, but like six times. I mean, what in the world was going on there? So that's so in a way, I can kind of identify with it. And this is, and again, it wasn't a, a, a situation like Isaiah's. I didn't see thunder. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't hear thunder. I didn't see lightning. There wasn't an earthquake or anything like that. Just as it was with Peter. Peter didn't see any of those things, but he, but he got a sense of the holiness of God and the power of God, and what it did to him, gave him an understanding of how sinful he is. And so when we consider the holiness of God, when we consider the glory of God, we're in a better position to understand the gospel. And the better way to better understand the gospel is, is, is to better understand who we are as sinners before Almighty God. Okay? Isaiah was one who knew that he fell short of the glory of God. We're familiar with Romans three, uh, Romans three twenty three. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And usually, if we're saying that to a non believer, what we do is we we say that with the hope of telling them that look, all have sinned. You can't say that you haven't sinned. Everybody has sinned. So that includes you. That includes me. That includes everybody on this earth. Uh, Romans three twenty three applies to everybody. All have sinned. Now, of course, that's true. But here's the thing. When we throw Romans 3.23 at people and say all of sins, you can't say that you haven't sinned. I think we missed the point a little bit. I, I'm hard pressed to run into run into people that say that they don't sin. I think there, that there are people that are out there that would say that. But most of the time, I think what you run into is people who acknowledge that, they, that they've sinned. Yeah, of course. I understand that I've sinned. I understand everybody has sinned. Nobody's perfect. I understand that. They'll say that. But here's what they'll say. But I'm not Hitler. I'm not Mussolini. I'm not a pedophile. I'm not a rapist. I'm not a murderer. I'm not any of those people. What you have are people who are making up their own standards. So what Romans 3.23 is saying is Romans 3.23 is not only saying that all people have sinned, but it, it shows us the makeup of that sin. Because of that sin, everybody falls short of the glory of God. It's that falling short of the glory of God that people seem to overlook. What that's saying there is that when you fall short of the glory of God, you're falling short of the standard of God, which is himself. Remember, we talked about the glory of God is the manifestation of his, of his perfections and his attributes. So here's the here's the bad news about 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 us when it comes to when it comes to the when it comes to the gospel. God is holy, we are not. That's that's really that's I mean when you really look at it. All of sin and fall short of the glory of God. That verse doesn't say for all of sin and fall short of the glory of Harry. It doesn't say that all of sin and fall short of the glory of Brenda. Or all have sinned and fall short of the glory of Timothy. It doesn't say those things because you know why? Because those people aren't the standard. Hitler isn't the standard. You know, it, you know, or I guess I should reverse that, saying you know we're we aren't our own standard because we set up our own standard. And then we say Hitler doesn't you know is far from meeting our standard. So of course he is outside of the circle of salvation. I've done, I'm a good enough person to make it into heaven. That's what people say. But that verse is saying that, you know, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the standard is God. And who is God? God is perfect. So there's, there's, there's the whole thing. God is perfect. You are not. And that's a problem. That's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. We've all fallen short of that standard of God. God is the standard. You also get the sense when you look at. Let me just point this out to you, and then um, and then we'll we'll call it quits here. Um, in Isaiah um, chapter fifty five, and this is and this is another passage that is uh, that is uh, pretty um, familiar to um, a lot of people. You know, when when um, in, in for example, when you look at verses eight and nine, a lot of people know this know this passage. Which says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. 
Now, the way that a lot of people will look at that passage, and they say, they'll say that, you know, we can't conceive of what's on God's mind. God knows better than we do how to handle something. God knows better than we do how to direct things. God knows how to call the shots. He knows he, he, his thoughts are higher than us. So what might, what, what might make sense in our minds is totally a lot of times out of kilter with, with who, what God is thinking. And God's thoughts are so vast and so wondrous and so much higher that we can't even compare. We can't bring ourselves up to that level to kind of, to kind of think the same thoughts that God has. So when God does something that doesn't make sense to us, we can't we can't say that that doesn't make sense. Why? Because God's thoughts are higher than our thoughts and his way is higher than our ways. That's the way that this passage is usually interpreted. Now, listen, I don't disagree with that notion. That is true. And when you look at it in that way, when you look at that notion in that way. My contention is, is that that's not what that's not what this passage is trying to get at here. This is, this is a repentance thing. Now, how do I know that? Where do I get that from? Well, if you read the verses previous to that, uh, specifically verses six and seven, it says, seek the Lord while he may be found, call upon him while he is near. Now here, here's a clicker. Verse seven, let the wicked forsake his way. And the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. See, this is a call to repentance, folks. What it's saying is that, because you notice again what it says there, let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Why? Well, why should he do that? Because, because of verses 8 and 9, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways. In other words, what he's saying is the fact that your thoughts are not my thoughts and your ways are, are, are not my ways is a problem. That's, just, that's not just stating a fact of how much higher God's thoughts are. God, this, this is saying that your thoughts are not like my thoughts and, my, and your ways are not like my ways, and that's a problem. So you need to forsake your thoughts and your ways, and you need to conform it to me in a saving way. This is a salvation passage, really, that you find in the Old Testament. That's that's what that's what that's saying there. So the wicked man in his ways and in his thoughts has fallen short of the standard because his ways and his thoughts are not are not the same. You see the difference there? You see what what that passage is trying to say? So this whole thing and this is what we're going to get into when we when we go into next time. Next time what we're going to talk about, we're going to talk a little bit more about that standard. You know, the falling short of the standard and, and what that looks like. Now, when we talk about what that looks like, what we're going to do, we're not going we're, we're going to try our best not to speak in general terms here. We're going to get specific. OK. And I think that the whole the whole thing with specificity is going to be is again, going to open the door a little bit wider into understanding just the grandness of the gospel, the wonderfulness of the gospel. And part of the thing that goes into that is just is just understanding just how far we've fallen short, okay? We Because we can say we fall short of the glory of God. It's just a saying. But, I mean, do we really understand that in its fullness? Maybe we won't understand it in a perfect degree. I don't know. But um, there are things that the Bible lays forth where if we understand it for what it truly says, then we're going to be like, wow, that's uh, that's something else. So that's what we're going to look at next time. So we're going to leave it there. Hopefully that's given you a picture. If we understand, you know, the about the God that we're dealing with. And it's something like this, addressing something like this is tough because, uh, you know, for me it just feels like there's a part of me that feels like I'm not doing this whole thing justice. Hopefully with the, with the help of the Spirit and the, and the help of God and hopefully he's been speaking through me so that it does come forth in a way that 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 is impactful or so that we can see what we're dealing with and so that it sets the, the the right stage for where we're going to be going in the next few weeks. Okay. So I want you to join us next time. We're going to talk about the standard. We're going to, we're going to talk about the standard of God and in what ways that man has fallen short and how that connects to the gospel and what the, how that leads into the good news. We're going to be talking more about that. It's going to be a progression. There's a, there's a progressive thought to all of this madness here, okay? And I want you to be with me every step of the way as we, as we look at this. And hopefully as we look at it, as this map unfolds, uh, we'll, we'll come to a greater understanding and the wonder of the gospel and just say, wow, 
this is totally, truly amazing. Okay, that's where I want us to be. So we'll leave it there, um, and uh, I hope you, I hope you'll, you'll join us um, next time. I, I, I'm confident that we're in for some good things, and I want you to be there with me as we explore more of Scripture together. Okay, so my name is Steve Gill, and I hope you have a good and blessed week. Bye now. Thank you.